Welcome to O-State Daily. Casey Porter here, joined by a very, very, very special guest this morning, Larry Reese, the Associate Athletic Director at Oklahoma State, joins. Larry, thank you so much. Hey, just great to be here. You and I go way back, so uh, this ought to be fun. Let's just have a little uh, fun with doing this and talking everything Oklahoma State. Stadium and arena voice of the Oklahoma State Cowboys since, I believe, uh, what year did you start that, Larry? You know, I got the job in 1990. Steve yeah. Buzzard hired me when Dr. Ed Pollan gave me uh, his uh, or gave uh, him my name, and uh, that was for Cowgirl basketball. In case of back then, we might have had 350 people there. There weren't many people going. Uh, Dick Alterman kind of had it going, but there mm-hmm. just weren't big crowds going to women's basketball. And man, I'm glad that that has grown through the years, and then. The next year after I did that, I was still a student on campus. Steve Buzzard stuck his neck out on the line a a little bit because it was kind of a political move. There were two faculty members that had been calling men's basketball, um, and that was uh, uh, Dr. Fowler had been doing that for 20 years. And I think uh, Chuck Shelsky, who worked over in intramurals, had been doing football for 25 years. So I can't blame Chuck Shelsky. He called President Campbell and kind of said, hey, they're trying to run me out. And like the president of the university doesn't have more important things to do. He called Steve Buzzard and said, you sure you know what you're doing? And Steve gave uh, Chuck Shelsky one more week to try to do it with the enthusiasm that he thought this little student could do it. And of course, he, he, he didn't quite do what Steve was expecting. So I did it the next week and moving forward. And that was in 91. So I started doing football, men's basketball in 91. I've stayed with the Cowgirls throughout because that's where I started. I have a lot of fun calling all of them. It kind of keeps me young. We've been a part of some great games, great moments, gotten to know great players and great coaches around here. One side note on Steve Buzzard, I love that man because he gave me a start and I'll always cherish our friendship. He's such a great guy, was our longtime media relations guy around here, just retired on campus after I think 40 years it was. And I mean, he's a difference maker at Oklahoma State. But one thing he he did to me as a young guy was he let Chuck Shelsky stay in the little bitty booth with me. Well, Chuck had been doing the games forever, and I swear Chuck was hoping I would fall out of the uh, stadium press box window so he could take over again, which I can't blame him. I mean, if they run me off, I'm going to be, you know, trying to hang on for dear life because I just enjoy doing it so much. I will tell you that Chuck and I, after a couple of years, became good friends. He became one of my spotters. He would yell out 49-yard punt and a seven-yard return, and I could uh, hear that as I'm talking and give that uh, to the crowd. So he became part of my team. But those first couple of years were uh, tense up there in the booth. You said 91s when you started all that. First of all, the press box at Boone Pickens Stadium, which was Lewis Field when you took over, and then the scorer's table, table at gallagher Ibe Arena. Well, you've seen a lot of changes over the years. We're pretty spoiled nowadays, aren't we? You know what? I'm really proud that uh, uh, I've been able to be a part, and my team, we've been able to be a part of a of a true renaissance period Mm -hmm. around here because when I got here, I mean, we had a rusty old stadium. We had a uh, track that had potholes in it. I mean, I used to say Goaty Bow, Oklahoma wouldn't be proud of our track. And uh, we had the smallest band box of an arena for – uh, you know, basketball and wrestling and and just our facilities weren't great. And I think it's really been, uh, it, there's been a lot of people key to that. And one of those is Terry Don Phillips, who was our athletic director, and he had vision. He also had a demand on Gallagher Arena because we had Eddie Sutton back home, you know. Uh, so there was a waiting list a mile long. People wanted tickets in there. So you had the demand. But he had to, you know, we had to borrow a lot of that money. They did a use tax in town that I think accounted for about $9 million. And then uh, we got a $2 million gift uh, from a gentleman over in Tulsa, uh, Walt Helmrich. And other than that, we bonded a lot of it. I think we're still paying on some of it. But if we hadn't done that, it wouldn't have helped with the mindset change. Because right after that, Boone Pickens said, I love the arena. Here's $20 million. Let's do football. And then we went out and for the first time had a team of fundraisers. First time ever in OSU athletics history. Harry Birdwell gets credit for that. He came on as our athletic director and he put a team of fundraisers together. And that group, our group that I got to be a part of, we raised over $104 million, which was unheard of at Oklahoma State. Wow. And then what Boone do? He came in and he said, hey, I'm, I love what you're doing, but it's not going fast enough. I'm getting older. Here's the largest gift ever given to an athletic department of our kind in this country. 
and it was 165 million dollars and we spent what was it 330 million on that stadium you see i see behind you i assume that'll be what we see behind you on this podcast and and um just remarkable what happened and then Boone thought he was going to stunt our growth, but what he did was inspire a whole bunch of people to give the Greenwoods for tennis, even Cecil Obrey for baseball. And you just go on down the list at the number of people that that he inspired to help make a difference with our facilities. And uh, what I'm proud of is everything that happened with athletics. The, all those donors seem to shift over to campus and you've seen a renaissance period on campus. And I'm proud that it started with OSU Athletics. You mentioned all these things and you know these things because you have been right in the middle of them as the associate AD at Oklahoma State. And so most people know you as the voice of, of Oklahoma State for as far as uh, in, in football and in basketball and doing the PA jobs for both of those situations. But tell us about your day-to-day job. Well, I'm so lucky because my day job is great because I try to build... Where are you at right now? You're at your own office, right? I'm in Where my you office right in gallagher Ab Arena. Historic can't beat gallagher. that, can you? No, you can't. I can't. I pinch myself often because I'm like, <laughs> I can't believe I get to do this because this is my home. This is this is my school right here. And I I love this place. And, and to be able to go out and, and um, build relationships with people that love the same school <laughs> that I do for the most part, that's who I talk to. And I, I mean, we have such great people, you know, our fan base, we're just down to earth, good people, salt of the earth. And we love Oklahoma State. I mean, our people loved Oklahoma State when we weren't winning in football. Yes. You know, it wasn't quite the crowd I see behind you in this picture, but it was it, it, it was a bell curve. You know, there's about twenty five thousand people that uh, even my first year to announce we were 0-10 and one. I can't believe they kept any of us, you know, but we were 0 10 and 1, and the same 25,000 people showed up. What I'm proud of is because of the Renaissance period, because of the success that the gifts from Boone Pickens and, and uh, our coach Mike Gundy, this, the, the consistent success that he's brought us, we packed the house now. We've sold out for the second straight year, and I think our people understand that buying a football ticket helps every one of our sports. Sure. But, Back to the original question. My job is to go out and meet with people that love OSU, and and I have the best day job. And then, you know, at night I get to call a game in Gallagher Arena, or on the weekends I get to call Cowboy football. I mean, uh, you know, I still get to do what I came to school for. I came to school to go into journalism and broadcasting, so I'm still doing a piece of it. I do a little radio on Thursdays on on uh, Triple Play Sports here in town, so I, I get to still play a little bit of what I wanted to originally go into. But I wouldn't change anything. I'm lucky to get to do what I get to do. Back in Miami, Oklahoma, there's three things that if you're around Larry Reese much, and we spent quite a bit of time all the way back to your days in the early 90s when you were the manager of the Jock Snitch Sporting Goods store, yeah, right? Jock Larry, you remember those days? Jock Snitch, yeah. You know, yeah. I did that just to stay in town. The owner reached out to me and wanted me to do it. I was like, I'm not a retail guy. I never worked in retail. He hired me to be the general manager, and we redid that store that's now the Chocolate Factory on 7th yeah. Street. And it was a great experience, but I did that for two, two and a half years. And then the legendary Rick Bellati, the Bellati family, they had KSPI, AM and FM, and had the newspaper. Uh, I talked to him and said, hey, I'm going to get back into what I came to school for. I, you know, I was done with school. And, and he called me back an hour later after we talked and said, why don't you just come to work for me? So I was the general manager uh, for a couple of years after being a sales guy for two years. And that was a great experience. But I, it all goes back to getting experience in my hometown of Miami and because I had that experience, I was able to go in and meet Rex Holt cold off the street and just say, hey, I'm in town now. I'm going to school. Uh, you know, I'd love to help you out. And he goes, do you have experience? I said, yeah, I did War Dog Sports and I did a lot of things in Miami because it's a small town. I had those opportunities. And a couple months later, he hired me to do Pioneer Baseball, get to call some of your games back in the day and all that. I mean, just too much fun. So uh, uh, it's just amazing how things work out in life. I've been very blessed. Over under on the amount of times you've had to correct somebody on how to pronounce Miami. Oh, uh, we're probably nearing a million at this point. I mean, it's, you know, that's just the Miami way. But we're going to immediately go, no, it's not Miami. It's Miami. I know it looks like Miami, but it's Miami. And if uh, truthfully, it's uh, it's the Miami tribe. And so, um, you know, they uh, uh, they actually they put a I think it's an A-H at the end of Miami. So, yeah. uh, you know, that is uh 
I've got Sean Taylor walking in my office here, one of my guys that I was talking about on my team. So he's going to be floating around like he's lost. We may awesome. do a silver alert here in a minute because awesome. he does look lost. But uh, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the deal. We always correct people on Miami. He's actually from Pitcher, Oklahoma, which no longer ah. exists. So yes. Miami is a great place. And there are so many benefits, as you know, growing up in a small town. So I've lived in Miami, Oklahoma, and then Stillwater. Some people yeah. – some people think I never got out of college, which is okay with me because I love being here. It kind of keeps me feeling young. You went to NEO right out of Miami High School, and so what drew you back to Stillwater? Well, I had friends in two places, and I'll tell you that in a minute, but I was lucky that I grew up about two and a half blocks from NEO. Yeah. Nobody had gone to a four-year college. My parents had gone to NEO. In, my, in the entire Reese family, nobody had really gone to college except my parents did go to NEO. If NEO's not there, I'm not sure I go to college. I was working at UPS, loading trucks early in the morning, 3.30 in the morning in Venita, Oklahoma. So I'd have to get up about 3 o'clock and, and speed to Venita and load the trucks. It was great for a college kid to have that job because back then, you know, I was a union member and I'm making about $10 an hour, which was huge back in 1987. Great experience for me, but I probably just would have stuck around and and maybe still tried to get in broadcasting, but I probably wouldn't have gone to college. But I got confidence going to any other. They gave me a little scholarship. My parents were able to help me out. And that's probably about all we could afford. And then because of that experience at NEO, I really think those community college and junior college, I hope they never go away. And I know they all have financial troubles. I know talking to regents the last few years, they've worried about colleges like that. But it's so key to people that grow up in those rural areas uh, to be able to have that experience. Because, again, um, I wouldn't be working at Oklahoma State had NEO not been there for me and helped me gain that confidence to move on. So uh, moving on from there to Oklahoma State, I had best friends, a group of best friends at both OU and OSU. And I'll admit, I grew up three blocks from Steve Owens Boulevard in Miami, Oklahoma. Yeah. 1969, Heisman winner, the first autograph I ever got was from Steve Owens. Now, I was an infant, and my parents got it when he came to speak at the Miami Rotary Club, but uh, that's the first uh, autograph I ever got. So, of course, I grew up thinking I was kind of an OU fan. I didn't dislike OSU, but back then, you only saw OU and you heard OU. You didn't hear a bunch about OSU. But I went to Norman one weekend to see those friends, and, man, it just was not for me. It was not the mindset that I have. It was not as laid back as I like. It wasn't as friendly as I like. It was uh, kind of partying out of control. Maybe we can get in a fight. That's not me. I guess I'm a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> when I came to OSU the next weekend or maybe two weekends later, had other best friends, including my very best friend was here, and he was a walk-on on the football team. So he got to watch 1988 with Barry Sanders and from the sideline and actually tackled Barry a couple of times in practice. That's his claim to fame. A buddy of mine, Ronnie Coker. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I came to Stillwater and it was home. I think a lot of people have had this experience. It was home immediately. People were so friendly. And I'll tell you that I got to be. Get your hair cut at Whisper and Richards. Absolutely. That, that's, uh, that probably sealed the deal, didn't it? Yeah. You know what? Whisper and Richard uh, is an icon around here. He's part oh, of yeah. the fabric of Oklahoma State. We can talk yeah. about that. But I just, I just knew this was home. And it didn't take me very long to realize I didn't like those people down south. I mean, it didn't take you very long in Stillwater to realize that. But, man, I found a home, and, and I've just never wanted to go anywhere else. I just love this place, and, and I'm just blessed that I've been able to stick around. You mentioned when you got here, you, you kind of just went up to Rex and said, hey, can I do this or can I do that? He asked you about your experience. Also, Bill Van S. We'll get to Rex here in a minute, but yeah. I'm going to cheat here because I actually sent a text to Bill earlier today because I wanted to get this right. How about 26 seasons as the radio play-by-play -play for Cowgirl softball, 23 for soccer. I don't think people understand how many how influential he's been for the soccer program. Softball, 99 to 2024. Soccer, 2000 to 2023. Bill Van Ness, after all that time, retiring. He yeah. is an absolute legend. He is, and you know what? We're tied uh, from way back when, so he was the – <clears throat> he was the general manager at K or not KSPI because that's here, but at um, KGLC KSSM Kissum One Hundred One. All right, and um, I had done some uh, sports there. And he's not the original guy that hired me for for doing some play by play for my high school when I graduated high school, but uh, he did give me my first DJ gig, and of course. 
that was great experience just be there and had the old turntables and i'm picking the songs on the country station sizzling country you know so i've still got some of those tapes they're pretty hilarious to listening to me trying to you know, I don't know if i was trying to be cool trying to be sexy i don't know why everybody goes through that when you first start doing things like this so emphasis on trying up now what's that emphasis on trying yeah trying real hard i wasn't succeeding <laughs> but, but that was a great experience so bill hired me way back when i mean that would have been uh probably 80 eight, probably 88 if i had to i bet it was 88 because i was i was doing the ups thing early in the morning and then in the evenings i would come and do some dj work or sometimes on the weekends and, and that was a great experience so i owe bill for that but yeah he's an icon around here he's been doing the news and sports forever i was so proud that i got to read a little uh, tribute to him and we had him down on the field earlier this season announcing his retirement he deserved that it yeah. made me remember back to another bill that we did that for and i was a young guy here but i'd gotten to know the legendary bill platt you know round and third and heading home and um you know i was so blessed to be around him get to quiz him get to learn from him i got to call a few games when rex was calling wrestling when bill was really struggling with his eyesight you know, you needed somebody in there that could kind of make sure he knew where the ball was. He just couldn't see very well, but he still, man, he had the pipes and he sounded so good. He was just legendary. But um, Bill Platt was dying of cancer. I think it was lung cancer. And I, I knew this because I was working at KSPI. And I remember coming and meeting with Chuck Bettingfield and Dave Martin saying, we've got to do something for him. And to their credit, they agreed. So I went and found old reel-to-reel tapes of Bill making calls like, Walt Garrison, the 19, whatever it was, 78 winner of the Big Tw- or the Big 8 rushing title. And uh, Mr. Iba back from the Olympics and a gold medal, you know, all these things that he had called through the year. And then, of course, I ended it. He's on the field. I ended it with this is your Cowboy baseball reporter, Bill Platt, round and third, wow. heading home. And I've got a picture over wow. my left shoulder. You can't see it here, but it's of him soaking it up as the crowd just went crazy. You see the crowd cheering for him behind, and he's just soaking it up. And I'm so glad we got to do that because he passed away two or three months later. And uh, he called our games for like 45 years. I don't know if many people know this. He followed Kurt Gowdy. Kurt Gowdy was here calling our game. At OSU? At, at, at OSU. Oh, you got to be kidding. Kurt Gowdy called our games for a year or two. He called back. Oh, wow. Not football. He was doing football for OU. So it was like the Bill Teagans before Bill Teagans. He was calling. Yeah one support for one team and and just trying to cover both and he called for mr iba for a year and then he moved on to to great things but bill took his place as a play-by-play guy and uh, so yeah bill was around i think he called baseball for 45 years so his remarkable career and he brought rex in and let rex back in the day he would let rex like do play-by-play for three innings and they would switch off kind of like your favorite major league team, the Cardinals, they they switch yeah. off. Used to be with Mike Shannon and, oh, and Joe Mr. Buck. Shannon. It was great, wasn't it? It was so great. I got to meet Mike Shannon last summer because of Matt Holiday. We took him up there for Albert and Yachty's last home game. And in the suite with us with Matt were several icons like Whitey Herzog. But the guy I wanted to meet was Mike Shannon. I went down yeah. and I said, you want to take a selfie with me, don't you? And Mike Shannon goes, you bet. So – I've got a selfie with the legendary Mike Shannon, but I do. I, I just admire though. That's what want, made me want to get into it was listening to Cardinal games and just I wanted to be around sports. And about my um, halfway through my junior year, I realized even though I thought I was a great athlete and playing three, four sports in Miami, that no coaches were talking to me. And I knew I wanted to be around athletics. And in a small town, you know, uh, things happen like little old ladies behind me in a grocery store saying, "Hey." you've got a great voice. You ought to go into radio, you know, and just planted a seed enough to, I was like, maybe that'll keep me around sports. And I'm fortunate that it, it has. And if my dad was still alive, he'd tell you, he gave me my voice. So I'm going to give my dad big Larry credit on that one, that uh, he's the one that gave me the pipes and, and I've been able to use them for my alma mater. What has Rex Holt meant to you and this university? You know, I think he means a lot to Oklahoma State. I mean, he's kind of become Bill Platt. I mean, he's basically yeah. been doing games for 40 years and wrestling matches for 40 years. And I always tell people he used to be my favorite roommate until my bride, Jimmy, came along. Now he's my <laughs> second favorite roommate. We lived together for what may be the funnest year of my life just because we were two bachelors. And um, uh, what's the old AD that he bought his house from? Uh, Jerry Havens. Yeah, it's a lot of basketball coach. Fighting Farmers. 
Yeah. And uh, he, t- he knew Rex was living in a uh, little utility on the back of somebody's house. I remember going there and he's just in a one bedroom with a little kitchenette. Here he is. He's probably 35 years old. He's the, uh, you know, the, uh, the most eligible bachelor in Stillwater, Oklahoma, but he doesn't have his own house. And so Jerry Haven said, I'll make you a deal in my house. You need a house. And Rex came to me because we'd become buddies for me doing games uh, for him at KSPI filling in. And he goes, hey, you wouldn't want to move into my house if I buy this, right? I just need to make sure I got this thing covered. I said, I'm in. Let's do it. And uh, so I lived with Rex for a little over a year until he met Penny, who I love. I was there at the Big 8 Baseball Championship when, when they got together. And, you know, two or three months later, they come out sitting in the living room of our great house there with a the swimming pool for two bachelors. You know, it was awesome. And they kicked you out. And no, Penny came in and showed me the ring. And I will admit that I immediately got up and did a shot, maybe two shots of tequila. And they're like, oh my God, Rex is off the market. What's this do to me? And they're like, no, 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 we want you to stay. You stay here. And I was like, I'm not staying here. This marriage thing will rub off on me. And so we all laughed about that. We still do. But, uh, I did end up moving out, and then I did end up getting married and uh, married Renee, and and we've got a beautiful daughter Lauren that's a theater girl living in Chicago now. So she's so far she's lived in Stillwater, New York City, and Chicago, and her dad has lived in Miami, Oklahoma, and Stillwater, Oklahoma. So she's braver than I am, but she's following her dreams. And then uh, of course later on, uh, you know, uh, Jimmy and I have now been married twelve years, so I've, I've been very blessed in that area. But I do think the marital thing still rubbed off on me, so I blame Penny and, and Rex. But they're two of my favorite people, and Rex just means a lot to me because he, he really helped me uh, figure out wh- how I needed to call games and the proper way to do it. He and Bill Platt were, were very key in, in me maturing and uh, being able to do some of this stuff. It would not be a Larry Reese interviewer conversation if I didn't ask you for your finest moments at Gallagher Iba Arena, Eddie Sutton, whatever, whatever generation, whatever games, take us through memory lane for Larry Reese. Well, you, you, you know, probably biggest moments. Um, you know, I, I think there's probably three that stand out. Uh, country hitting the half court shot, yeah, and that's a funny story because I'm a young pup. There, it's like what ninety one or ninety two, probably ninety two, because we were in uh, conference play playing Missouri, and there's two seconds left. And I think it was Milton Brown threw it to half court and country. Eddie Sutton set it up, was supposed to either throw it on one wing to Brooks Thompson or the other wing to Randy Rutherford. Great options, but you only got two seconds, right? Two point something. Well, country bobbles it. It's right in front of me, probably 20, 25 feet in front of me. He bobbles it. He turns around, flings it up, puts his hands in the air. He knows it's good somehow. And it goes in and it was the wildest moment. The place went nuts. Now I'll admit that, a few thousand people had trickled out because they thought we were beat. Now, they'll never admit that, but they had. But the place still erupted. And Norm Stewart, Storman Norman, came right at me and started screaming because he didn't think we started the clock. And I'm just this you know, young guy going, holy smoke, Norm Stewart is all over me. So I'm a team player, so I take it for a while. And then finally, I lift up my mic and I point down at Kent Bunker, who's actually on the clock. I'm like, what me? I've got the mic. You know, so I threw him under the bus. And uh, Norm proceeded to chew on uh, uh, to chew on Kent Bunker, but the reason he was chewing on us was he knew his team had lost. That shot just tied the game, but we're yeah. going to overtime, and there is no way Missouri's winning. And I need to look it up. But in my mind, we outscored them like thirteen to three or something in overtime. Yeah, it was. I mean, they were really good, but he knew that it was over once Country got that one, and it was over. I mean, Randy and Brooks and and uh, Country took over from there. That's a great moment. Triple overtime win over Kevin Durant, the Longhorns. That was a crazy night. I mean, you got Byron Eaton out of bounds, flipping it up, and it goes in. Kevin Durant, every time you thought you had it won, he bombed one from dang near half court. He was good. And then Mario Bogan hits the game winner, and the Cowboys escape. I like to tell people, Kevin Durant never won in Gallagher Arena. That was his only time, but he never won here. Uh, you can also say that about the old freshman uh, Trey that uh, was down at OU. He never won in this building either. I like that, but those are two very special ones. And then I would say the biggest win that I've ever seen was after the plane crash back in 2001. And you got to give Quinn Snyder from Missouri credit because he told Eddie Sutton that uh, it doesn't matter when you're ready to play, you tell us. And this always gets me uh, because such maturity out of a young coach. He said, you tell us when you're ready and the, the Missouri Tigers will be there. 
And uh, that night, it was so important because our team was emotionally drained. Those families needed something to cheer about. The ones that had lost their family members, we all felt like we lost family members. The fan base needed it. And that was a 69-66 hard-fought victory, but that's the most important victory I've ever seen in Gallagher Ab Arena. We needed that one for sure. Let's talk about the throat cancer back in 2015. We can talk about that, thank goodness, now because you have beat that. I know that was a scary moment for you. You have a great message for that. Well, you know, uh, anytime you're told that you have cancer, um, it it just knocks the wind out of you. But I'll tell you, one of the best things we do around here is uh, it used to be coaches versus cancer. We now call it the Eddie Sutton Foundation home to Cowboys versus cancer. I encourage everyone to get involved in this. I mean, it is when you're going through that, you want to know a couple things. You want to know that people care about you and are praying for you and you need distractions. And that program gives that to so many little kids, so many families. We pay tribute to so many cancer survivors or those that are battling and they're able from when I'm reading their public address uh, before a ball game to thank everybody that's helping them. So it's a great program and we put a lot of money toward cancer research, which is so important. But yeah, I was told that I had cancer on a Monday right before Christmas. And I remember putting my head down and my wife, Jimmy, hugging me and we're just scared to death. And about 90 seconds into feeling sorry for myself, I thought about those kids, hundreds of kids that I've introduced and met through the years I've introduced to our crowds, and I thought, man, if those kids can do it, Larry Reese, you better buck up. And I quit feeling sorry for myself, and uh, I called uh, uh, my doctor, ear, nose, and throat doc here in town, and and just said, hey, uh, I've been told I've got cancer. It's five after five. And Doc Crawley said, Larry, how fast can you get here? He goes, I'm still in the office. And I said, I'll be there in five minutes. We were close. And uh, we got over there and he scoped me and tried to find it and couldn't find it because they told me I had cancer. They didn't know where it was. Scary. So Doc Crowley said, hey, we're, it, it's Christmas this week. The following Monday, I will get you in. I'll put you out. I'll scope you. I'm going to find it for you. That was probably the most enjoyable Christmas I've ever had in my life because I was laser focused on my family because I thought, Am I going to be here to watch my parents grow old and help them? Am I going to be here to walk my daughter down the aisle one of these days when she gets married? Am I going to be here to to grow old with with my beautiful bride? So all these things. So I'm laser focused on all my family, my niece and nephew, my brother. And then that next Monday, he scopes me. Doc Crowley finds that it's throat cancer, which to me sounded like the worst thing that I could get. And... um, you know, yeah, because of your profession, obviously. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, but I'll tell you, in that moment, all I wanted to do was be around for those reasons I just mentioned. So I was like, if I have to give up announcing, I'll do it. Uh, I'll find a way to survive without it, even though it's my pride and joy and I love doing it. And, um, so I was just focused on getting through it. And from there, I, uh, I called Boone Pickens because he had given uh, a pretty substantial gift to MD Anderson. And Mike Holder and I called him and I just told him that I'd been diagnosed and he goes, Larry, if you hadn't called me, I'd have been mad at you. He goes, you know, I gave $40 million to MD Anderson. I said, yes, sir. That's why I'm calling you. I realize that. <laughs> and he said, by the end of the day, you will hear from MD Anderson and you'll be in good hands. And wow. I said, thank you. And I, it's sad that in uh, when you're having a health crisis that you you got to rely on connections because our health system shouldn't work like that, but it just does. And right. I went on to Tulsa to meet with a couple of donors and by the time I got onto the Broken Arrow Expressway, um, I got a call from MD Anderson and they set up my time. And uh, I was on my way to figuring this thing out. Because whenever you get a diagnosis like cancer, there are great doctors in the state of Oklahoma, but you need to go to a specialist. Yeah, sure. We've got great doctors here, but they're not just focused on throat cancer for the most part. They're doing a lot of different things. I was talking to a doctor who was a Stillwater high grad. He was down at Procure Proton Therapy. I said, how many throat cancers have you radiated? He said, I think you'll be my 11th. Well, my radiologist down at MD Anderson probably does 11 of those a day. Right. So you kind of want, I said, I want the gym rat. I want the Keaton Page, the Phil Forte of throat cancer radiation. So that's why I went down there. One of the side things that's been really good is uh, I've made relationships down there. So I've been able to help several former or not former, uh, several cowboy and cowgirls 
that need to get into MD Anderson cancer treatment, I've been able to kind of streamline that for them because oh, nice. of some connections I've had. So that's been a true blessing besides the fact that I got through it. So 10 years ago now, a little past 10 years. And so I still go down every year because I want to keep those relationships and sure. I just want to make sure I'm in the clear. But I've been I've been very blessed. And my radiologist down there, even though he didn't know me from Adam, he figured out what I did. And so the second time I went to see him, he said, you're probably worried about your voice. And I said, well, I am, but I really just want to be around. And he goes, I get that. He goes, but we're getting pretty good at this. And he goes, I'm going to protect your voice. And he put a little piece of metal here every day for the six weeks that I went in for radiation and protected my vocal cords. He goes, hey, make it a little deeper, which I think it has, which I'm fine with deeper. That's all right. He said, and you may sound a little raspier. You may sound like Jack Buck by the time we're yeah. done. I said, if I can sound like Cardinal announcer Jack Buck without smoking two million cigarettes, I'll take it. <laughs> so I may be a little gruffer now and all that, but uh, truly blessed to get through all that. And my prayer posse helped me because I I've thought when I get that, got diagnosed, I don't care who knows. It wasn't anything I did. I just want everybody praying for me. And man, my prayer posse lifted me up. They printed off, you know, Cowboys versus Cancer printed off uh, t-shirts that said I ride with the voice that we had a local mailman come up with that uh, when he actually tweeted it back at me and uh, I just uh, I just appreciate uh, Mr. Bays on that when he helped me out with that and and that kind of became the way people showed support for me uh, whether it's on social media or little notes they'd always write hashtag I, I ride with the voice and man that meant the world to my family and I wow incredible story that's the important part of today's conversation coach let's move on to mike gundy you talk about you know you said you got here during your first year with the 10 and one year yeah talk about what mike gundy has meant to oklahoma state oh as a player a coach all that and then maybe a little bit on this year's team well you know uh we've never had consistent winning in cowboy football we've had up and down you know we've had great some of the greatest players to ever play the game leslie o'neill you know thurman thomas and Barry Sanders and on and on and on, but we've never had consistent winning. It was always up and down, a couple, three good years and then back down, you know, and Mike Gundy has given us consistent winning. I mean, it's been extraordinary. The, the facilities have helped, but man, Mike Gundy's done a great job. We were in school together, uh, so I've known Coach Gundy for a long time. I consider him a friend. Um, I think he'll be in the in the uh, OSU football ring of honor one of these days. I mean, he's the winningest coach in our history. He's uh, uh, the all-time leading passer in Big 8 conference history and will always be that because we're not the Big 8. Oh, really? Anymore. I did not yeah. know that. Yeah. And oh, wow. So uh, he he's remarkable, and we are lucky to have him. And I know people are frustrated about this year, but I promise you nobody's more frustrated than Coach Gundy, his staff, and, and our players because they truly uh, wanted to battle for the Big 12 championship. And we haven't started out the way we wanted to in Big 12 play. And so – uh, what I want to say to people, I know there's a lot of upset people out there, but I appreciate the fact that you're upset because you're upset because you are so passionate about this program. But let's let's try to remember, let's not blow things up. We've never had it this good. Now, I realize there's a whole generation, Casey, that aren't like you and I and went through those tough losing seasons. Yeah, 10 and one was my first year on yeah, campus. There you go. We came <laughs> in on that together uh, in a way. And it's painful, but it builds a lot of character. And. I think it makes us a little bit of who we are because we don't get in people's face when we beat them because we know how it feels to lose. But we've got a generation that doesn't, so they're kind of spoiled rotten. But that's a good thing. But I just, uh, you know, I just hope everybody will stick with us. I know we will because we are a resilient fan base. And then I'll tell you one thing I want to mention. I mentioned the plane crash earlier. You know, uh, I talked to Dick Sorgel, the great three-sport letter winner who just passed away in the last year, and I was – honored to get to speak at his funeral and pay tribute to him one of my favorite storytellers he and i were talking at a basketball reunion years ago and i was telling him my story i told you about going to ou and osu on different weekends and realizing where home was i said the people were just amazing he said larry and remember he went to school in the 50s he's a guy starting quarterback started for mr Ivan on the hardwood and he was the winning pitcher of the 1959 college world series championship game all right they don't get any better than dick sorrel and he said, Larry, it's always been the people. And so that just hit me because here he is back in the 50s. And he was here even, I think, maybe sometimes in the early 40s, his family would bring him down. But And then here I am. I got here in 89, and I'm still here, and it's still the people. But I think what turned us into the OSU family were all these tragedies that we've come together on, you know, 
tragedy with the OSU plane crash in 2001 where we lost 10 members of the family. Then we lose uh, four members of the OSU women's basketball family, and that brought us together. We had the homecoming tragedy, and this isn't a tragedy, but is another instance of us galvanizing, and that's when Sports Illustrated attacked us with the salacious expose on us that we found out didn't have hardly any truth in it anywhere. It was just lies and uh, to sell magazines, but the damage they did to us there, but that that really brought us together uh, and galvanized us as a fan base. So you're saying right before kickoff comes from the the results of the SI that's investigation right. there where and we all galvanized, you said. Can you go over that? Yeah, you, you did your homework because that's true because, uh, you know, I was just ticked about it, especially when yeah. we read the first one and went, this isn't true and that's not true and this isn't. Um, all, almost all of this is not true. And it was us being attacked. And so before kickoff, I just uh, said, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Boone Pickens Stadium. As we get ready for the kickoff, this is our home. This is our family. And this is our team. Are you ready for Cowboy football? Ooh. And the, the place went crazy. <laughs> Got me and ready, man. Let's go. It ever since, but it was just really my statement to say, we're in this together. Let's back our team. And uh, that resonated with people. And now it's something that I do before each kickoff in football but I, I really believe that's true this is our home and this is our family and this is our team good for a cowboy first down and goal is that something that that you came up with or did it just happen or or how'd I, that I didn't come really out? think about it ahead of time most of these things that i say that kind of end up sticking yeah i don't uh, you know they just kind of happen and, and i think that's better than trying to force something but uh you know that i i did start introducing bullet and saying here comes bullet years ago that had not been done and i just oh nice hey, we need to draw attention to bullet you know yeah absolutely and then, you know we had uh, cbs sports line name us the rowdiest arena in the country so yes. i started announcing as you know welcoming people to the rowdiest arena in the country and i want to get back to the rowdy and yes i will say i think coach lutz is an incredible hire i think chad weiberg has made a couple of tremendous hires in a row with steve lutz who's from this region he's from texas which anytime we've been good we've had great players from texas nobody's going to outwork him uh and uh he's just a hard-nosed guy and then he ties back to both the eddie sutton tree and mr yep. ibis tree yeah you know uh, so it's it's really remarkable that he ties and that me I, I, that just means something to me and i think it means sure. something to our people he's defense first which our people are going to love and uh, he's going to have discipline so when a guy takes a bad shot, he, you're going to see him yank people. I think the place is going to go crazy when he does yeah. it because we haven't seen it lately. You yeah, know? And I love Coach Boynton. I'm not no saying anything negative about That was his style. But we need to have discipline and pull guys out when they make a mistake or they take a bad shot. And You're going to see Coach Lutz do that. But we need to get behind him. Uh, the other day we had a group of donors and Chad Weiberg, who is, we're so fortunate to have one of our own as our athletic director. He loved mm -hmm. it. Lost his brother when we lost the yeah. 10, and, but still wanted to be back home. And, I'm so grateful that he's here. But he said, listen, we can't wait for Steve Lutz to turn things around to fill the arena. We need to fill the arena so that Coach Lutz can turn things around. Yeah, right. And I thought that was a great way to put it. And it's true. So get your Cowboy basketball season yeah. tickets. There's plenty of good seats available. And we're going to have fun in here. I don't know. I don't know that we're going to be world beaters this first year. But you're going to see what Coach Lutz and his staff and the players are trying to do. And I think uh, people are going to be excited. I do think we're going to win a lot of games, too. But uh, I just don't think we're going to win the championship the first year. If we do, hallelujah. Uh, but uh, Steve Lutz is a heck of a ball coach, and he fits Oklahoma State. No doubt. And if I know the rowdy side of the honorary side of Larry Reese like I think I know it, <laughs> when they told you you had to stop saying for the visitors, mm -hmm. I promise you you didn't go down without a fight on that one. Oh, I fought for a while. That was Coach oh, yeah. Holder. You know, Coach Holder got a letter <laughs> yeah. from um, – from i think it was from one lady from colorado and the letter read dear mr holder we had a great time in stillwater the community is beautiful the campus is unbelievably beautiful the people couldn't have been friendlier like we were talking about but that damn announcer i mean <laughs> you know he couldn't even remember we were the buffaloes so i remember coach holder came in he goes larry he threw the letter down had me read it he goes why do you do that we've all got our you know, like we've all got an Eddie Sutton impersonation. We've all got a, a Mike Holder impersonation. Why do you do that? And so I explained to him that it's not a pejorative. It's, it is just a cue for people to get off their dust because this is our home 
field, right? And so it's just a cue. He goes, well, I don't know if we ought to do that. And I was like, well, coach, we used to call them the visitors on the scoreboard. It's not a negative term. They're just the visitors. And so we, I mean, every time I saw him in the hall, he'd go, the visitors. And, and we'd have to have another conversation. <laughs> but I fought through it. So I got to do it that year. The next season, we played Nebraska. And I think we beat them here. I think mm-hmm. it might have, I don't know if it was Les Miles or who it was. But anyway, we beat them. And um, uh, he says, uh, he, he gets another two letters from two guys that were obviously together from the Cornhuskers. And they said, uh, same thing. What a beautiful community. What a great university and, and campus setting. People were great, but that damn announcer. And he puts them in front of me, and I look at him, and he goes, I don't think it's good sportsmanship. I was like, it, it's, it has nothing to do with sportsmanship. It's a cue to yell loud because it's third down for the visitors. Yeah, right. He said, don't do it anymore, and he walked out. So I was just like, so oh. for a decade, I couldn't use that cue that it just happened organically right sure but uh when uh, chad weiberg took over i knew chad was for it so i wasn't even going to ask permission i was just going to do it absolutely the marketing Th- team, that's the Henri larry reese side you know. i know right there but yeah. the market you always ask, you can ask for forgiveness later oh yeah but the marketing <laughs> team went to chad weiberg and chad said yes it's back so they came to me and said it's on i was like okay i was just going to do it but you guys took a chance there and chad was on the right side of it in my opinion so it's been back now for a a few years but it was a decade of not being able to do it and and uh, you know it's one of those deals where the squeaky wheels got the grease i oh, yeah. said to coach holder all right coach i promise you i'll never call the colorado buffaloes or the nebraska cornhuskers the visitors again because guess what they were both leaving so yeah. if i'd have been quick enough i would have said that maybe i would have helped but i'm so glad it's back because i do see people get up when i say that it's like a little reminder that, hey, I need to make noise right here because we need to get the defense off the field and get the ball back for our offense. Rex is my witness. I told everybody I know, trust me, I know Larry Reese well enough. He will bring that phrase back because he knows how much Oklahoma State fans it, love it, that. It was. I appreciate that, Casey. And it's amazing how many people said something to me about oh, yeah. through that. Oh, they were decade. pissed, man. OSU fans were pissed. Yeah, through that decade, uh, there was a lot of And I just had to give them the same answer. But yeah. I'm glad it's back because I do think it helps the home team a little bit. And even though I'm supposed to walk that fine line, uh, you know where my heart is and what color the blood is that's pumping through these veins. It is definitely part of the game day experience. Larry Reese, I've taken a lot of your time. This has been such an honor for me to get, get, to, get to catch back up with you oh. and talk about some old times, talk about what we both love. Oklahoma State, football, basketball, sports, all that. So, Larry, thank you so much. Man, I just want to say thanks to all of our fans that love this place. And, and uh, you know, I like to – I really feel this way. I know we're having a little bit of a tough run here in football. They're working to get it turned around. But it is so good to be us. I'm just yeah. telling you. It is so good to be a cowboy, uh, to be involved with Oklahoma State. And uh, let's just keep that perspective. It's good to be us. Everybody keep wearing that orange and go Pokes.